Uh, thank you very much, Nick. And um, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation to come along to this meeting. Um, so uh, when I was asked about uh, giving a talk about big data, um, I said, well, actually, I'm not really a big data person. Um, um, so I'm here to learn about some of the issues associated with big data. Um, but what I thought I would do um, is um, illustrate some uh, with my talk, illustrate some of the issues associated with using large data sets and how we get, might get the information out of that. Um, actually, one, one correction. I was um, the director of the Center for Medical Image Computing, but I'm now co-director, and one of my other co-directors, I hope, is sitting in the audience somewhere. Um, and there's um, four of us who are now sharing, um, running the place. I ran it for, for 10 years and decided to sort of hand over the reins, and I'm enjoying my freedom now uh, from uh, having, having, having done that. Um, so um, just a little bit more about myself. I've been probably around in medical imaging for far too long. Um, sort of started life with a PhD in CT scanning just after whole body CT scanning was invented, and that tells you how old I am. Um, uh, but I've um, been working in um, healthcare-related work all that time, so I started off with an um, um, NHS delivery job. I was um, helping to provide um, um, imaging expertise um, in, in a number of hospitals in the south of England, and then came back into academia um, to um, convince that there were um, ways that we could improve the imaging technology that we had available to us and use that to um, uh, change healthcare. And still my, um, what sort of keeps me going is to um, change the way that we deliver um, um, healthcare. So I want to see the stuff that we do um, clinically translated. So that's where I come from. Um, but um, the imaging technology and the computational uh, tools that are, be, are um, associated with that, of course, are very important to enable us to do that. Um, so... Um, how I will define my, uh, structure my talk, just a little bit on some of the prerequisites and some of the technologies that are available now uh, to help bring all this data together. Um, I'm going to illustrate with five applications, so two recent applications, um, which I know a little bit more about because they come from our centre, um, um, or our centre or, or our close collaborators, um, but it's not in cancer imaging, it's in neuroimaging, but it's to illustrate some points. Um, and then three applications in cancer imaging, two of which are taken from the literature and one of which is our own. Um, and then just um, finish up with a couple of comments about some of the challenges that I think that we have. Um, so one issue, and it's, I think it was touched on by one talk so far, but maybe it will be debated later on in the discussion, um, is that if we're really going to do big data with clinical data, um, and there are some um, significant issues that still need to be sorted out on the regulatory side in terms of uh, patient conf confidentiality, who owns the data, and then who controls it, which is not necessarily the same as who owns it. Um, um, it would be nice to think that all our um, hospitals are rather like sort of supermarkets is you just wander in there and you pick up a shelf of CT scans of this and MR scans of that, take them away and analyse them to your heart's content and then get some useful information out of that. Um, it, it is nothing like that. Um, and there's a few people I know in the audience who have been tackling some of those issues. Um, and in particular, I think Ken Young, who's going to be in the um, uh, discussion later, who can tell us, I'm sure, about some of his experiences with the breast um, um, screening programme and um, building up mammography data sets. Um, there's technical issues um, associated with the quality of data. Um, most of the work that we do, um, most of the work that I still do, um, is involved uh, with what we call small-scale clinical trials. So we take a relatively small number of data sets, a few tens maybe. Um, we work very hard to tightly control the way that the data is acquired and the information that we extract uh, to ensure that it is of the right quality to enable us to test a particular hypothesis or an evaluate a, a new methodology. We then hope to see that go up to a larger-scale clinical trial of maybe a few hundreds, maybe up to about 1,000 individuals, um, um, keeping that tight QA. But that's a world of difference away uh, from going out to um, um, the standard of clinical care and the data sets that are, um, are routinely available to us. Um, and so that has technical implications um, in terms of the types of technology that we can apply to get information out of that data. Um, now, core to... Um, I guess what um, I think um, my or our group's contribution has been over the last few years um, is thinking, well, what is an image? An image is a spatial distribution of information. Um, and therefore, if we're going to relate that information by bringing those images together, we need to establish spatial correspondence because it's the spatial information that is inherent in the image. Um, and so we've done quite a lot of work um, in dealing with um, uh, the tasks of image registration uh, to bring that data together. And I think it's underpinning quite a few of 
the examples where um, some of these techniques are now showing some quite interesting results. Um, so we've been working in image registration for a, a long time, and this is just a slide I borrowed from Teb Ursulin um, from our group, um, um, who has developed some of the more um, 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 efficient implementations of a non-rigid registration algorithm that brings things together. Um, but the key thing is, if I can make my... Whoa, how do I do this? There we go. Um, I'm going to press that button in just a sec. Um, but what we have here in this uh, plot is a plot of intensity in one... Uh, we were going to register two images. Um, the plot of intensity in one image plotted against the intensity at the same location um, in the other image. Now, those two images are misregistered, um, and what we want to do is bring them into registration. And so the statistical techniques um, that have been applied over the years... Um, to do that, but if we bring them into registration, we see how there's a focusing of this image, and we now finish up with a good correlation. These are two images taken different, uh, different times of the same individual. So there's noise on that line, but there's basically a linear uh, correspondence. Now, when we look at lots of different types of images, in particular images taken with a different modality, it might be MR, it might be CT, even with optical images taken with different camera um, settings, we find that we don't get a nice straight line, but we do get a coherent pattern. And it's that coherent pattern that we can capture to establish correspondence. Um, there's a technique based on mutual information that we all looked at about ooh, 20 years ago now, um, which has proved very powerful at bringing these things together. Interestingly, it's those same techniques of image similarity that are now being used to trawl through large databases to try and establish correspondence between um, um, images taken in very different ways. And it's quite interesting to see how that um, uh, technology has been uh, sort of um, stood the test of time um, in terms of establishing correspondence. But now, one example. Um, where this has been used to understand something interesting biologically and, and clinically. Um, these are slides I borrowed from um, Daniel Rukert and Joe Hainel. Daniel Rukert is Imperial, Joe Hainel is now at King's College, and this work was um, linked to a, an EPSRC program grant that's just finished. Um, and their challenge, or the challenge from the physicians that they're working with, um, was to understand um, how the uh, fetal brain develops and how the um, infant brain develops immediately after birth. There's very important development going on in a child um, at that time. And most importantly, how um, prematurity, i.e. the premature birth of a baby, uh, might affect that development. Um, and they, connect, uh, they collected a large amount of data, um, both um, um, pre-birth and post-birth, um, of the brains of images of the brains of these individuals. Um, they collected, um, at least in this study, and they've got many more now, um, they collected um, 132 now. Got to do a little adjustment, there we go. Um, 132 scans, and these are shown here. They're, they're, they're tiny, so you can probably barely make them out. Um, but they're all plotted there. So these are going from about 36 weeks gestation through to about 46 weeks gestation. Um, uh, these are actually ordered in size of the brain um, there, because the brain grows over time. Um, but what they're interested in was seeing what other information is there in there. And they applied a um, um, dimension reduction technique, which is related to what we heard um, uh, just now, uh, principal component analysis, to look at the similarity between different images. So they actually matched up each of these images um, with the image that was most similar um, um, in the database using a, um, a measure of image similarity. And what they did then was to map this all onto a two-dimensional manifold, a two-dimensional surface. So they reduced the very large number of dimensions of the um, uh, data that we see there um, just to, the, to two dimensions. Um, and this, if I can make this movie work again, is what this process is doing. So this is mapping by looking at the similarity of these images, um, bringing these images together. Then the interesting bit is what does that tell us? So this is just the two um, uh, um, components that describe the um, data set. But now if we map onto um, gestational age, um, so going from blue um, 30 weeks up to um, uh, red 46 weeks, um, and we look at the mean trajectory through that, um, we find that we get um, a measure of how the average brain will develop 
But more interestingly is what's happening down here and what's happening at the top there. Um, so we can see where there's some abnormalities of, um, of, of fetal brain growth, basically associated with ventricles being too large because the brain isn't uh, developing enough, is captured in a, a plot like that. So that's now giving insight back to the neonatologists uh, to understand better um, some of the problems associated with um, uh, the development of the brain. Um, next example um, is from um, um, uh, Danny Alexander, who's somewhere in the audience. There he is. Um, so you can correct me if I get this wrong. Um, the same registration technology has been used to, for example, measure the um, uh, uh, shape and volume, and in particular the thickness of parts of the brain in the study at the end of life now, um, looking at the dementias, in particular looking at Alzheimer's. Um, so Alzheimer's is a complex disease. Um, I suspect almost every family in the UK um, has, um, um, has a, a sufferer from this disease um, 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 in their family. Um, so people are becoming more and more familiar with the dreadful um, social uh, consequences and personal consequences of this disease. So we're looking at ways that we can um, um, understand the disease better. So what Danny Alexander and his team have been doing um, is thinking of Alzheimer's as a, um, a series of events. Now, some of these events are changes in cognitive, um, um, how, how the patient understands what's going on around them. That's a cognitive assessment test. Some of them are associated with serum um, um, or um, CSF um, analysis. So there's chemicals that we can measure the, um, um, the level of, and these change over time. And some of them are associated with the MR image that we can measure the change and in particular the reduction in volumes of certain parts of the brain. And so we can build up um, using a technique, um, I'll probably get this wrong, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Did I get that right? Thank you. Um, um, which he can explain what it's all about, so much more than I can, um, to um, use a probabilistic model of how um, this event-based um, disease um, takes place, how the different events take place. Now, the reason for doing that, and this has been work that's been extended just recently by um, Alex Young, one of um, uh, Danny's uh, PhD students, and it's just about to be presented up in a conference in Scotland, is when we map out all these different events, as is shown schematically on these slides, um, we get quite a wide range of different um, responses across a population. Um, um, but if we analyse that in more detail, we can split it up into different subtypes. Um, and if you look at those different subtypes, three subtypes seem to emerge from the uh, 380 data sets from a large, data, um, large um, international database um, called the ADNI um, um, database that uh, people use. Um, intriguingly, and this is from a conversation I had just now from, um, we're, we're with Danny to make sure I got the story right, subtype three this just looks as though it may be just normal aging. Um, that's, these are patients who are difficult to diagnose, and so a few normal aging um, um, individuals who actually haven't got Alzheimer's uh, might come in. But the intriguing thing is subtype 1 and subtype 2, um, where there's a more general um, um, atrophy in subtype 1 and a more focal base of atrophy um, in subtype 2. Or did I, was it? Yeah, um, I, I think I got that the right way around. Now, that is interesting. We're learning that from the data um, because perhaps this is a way of stratifying the patients. So if we have a drug that's going to um, um, interfere with disease progression in a particular way, we can then focus it on a particular um, uh, group and improve our statistics for doing that. So now on to, um, back, because this is a CURK uh, conference, on to cancer. And there's two examples I'll show um, from the literature, uh, which I'm familiar with, but it's not work that I've been closely involved with. Uh, one is in um, breast cancer uh, risk um, assessment. As many of you will probably know, um, the dense breast, that is a breast that appears more opaque on x-rays, gives a significantly higher risk of that um, uh, uh, lady um, suffering from breast cancer at some stage in the future. But there's thought that there's other information that's in those X-ray mammograms. Every lady from the age of 40 or 45 will be going regularly for a, a mammogram. And this is what the images look like. So um, um, this is the left side, this is the right side, projected together to um, assess the symmetry. And analysis of those images, which are now um, stored in a way that makes this an analysis um, possible, and one can start applying a, a number of texture measures uh, to try and understand better what the differences are. And there's a study that was dreamt up by Mads Nielsen in Copenhagen, the results of which are shown here. 
Um, so he took um, a number of ladies who had a um, um, who were diagnosed with breast cancer from the big screening program. It's actually the Dutch um, screening program. Um, and he went back two to four years to their previous mammogram, uh, which was reported as being normal um, by the radiologist. Um, and he compared that with um, match controls where they didn't have cancer. Um, and he did discover that there was a change in the orientation of the texture patterns. Um, in the normal um, ladies, there's actually an orientation of the texture of the breast towards the nipple, um, associated with normal anatomy of the breast. That um, pattern was disrupted um, by whatever it was that was leading to a higher risk of cancer. Um, and it, by doing this then as a prospective study, um, he was able to get an area under the curve in an ROC analysis of 0.63. So it's not good enough for um, accurate diagnosis, but it is good enough for um, showing that there's some interesting um, work to be done there. And he also applied it to another data set and published that very recently. Um, the other example I want to show is in radiomics, um, or sorry, there's been termed radiomics, I'm not sure I like the word, um, but it's sort of got a lot of interest now in the um, uh, uh, medical image analysis um, world. Um, and in this work that was led by Philip Lampam in Maastricht um, and published last year, um, they took 1,019 head and neck cancers, um, or lung cancers, and they... Um, dreamt up 440, that's a very large number, 440 texture features to uh, analyze the structure and texture um, of the images. Associated with the shape of the lesion, um, shown on CT, those are what the CT scans look like on the left. Um, uh, sorry, on your right. Um, and they looked at the intensity, texture, and so on and so forth. Um, and they were able to show that a number of these texture features had prognostic significance. So you can, certain things, particularly those associated with an increase in um, um, the variance of the image, um, were associated with poorer outcomes. Um, and that seems to link with uh, cancer heterogeneity somehow. But we're talking about spatial heterogeneity rather than genetic heterogeneity. But I'm intrigued by that. Um, and then, taking that one step further, they were able to show that this prognostic signature derived from that is associated with an underlying uh, gene expression, um, which is, I think, shown on the next slide. So um, this is just to say, when they mapped out um, various things they got from them, genetic studies, um, they were able to see that there was some relationship between the image intensities and the um, and gene expression data, and this was the first time that this sort of thing had been shown, is now a, um, a source of intense interest. Now, the final example, I'll just go through this very quickly, and it's not really a big data, but it's where we're learning from large databases how to um, do something. And in this case, it's how to deliver therapy in the prostate. We're working with uh, Professor Emberton, Mark Emberton here, to more accurately direct a needle into the prostate, um, guided by an MR machine, uh, an MR scan, and in particular, how we can then um, direct focal therapy if focal therapy is... Um, um, selected for that particular patient. The challenge here is to map the ultrasound uh, that we get during this rather undignified uh, pose for this patient here, um, showing how the um, needle is placed into the uh, prostate, um, and have mapped that onto an MR image here um, so that we can direct the needle to a, a region of um, risk um, seen there. Um, and the way this is done um, is by doing a um, generating a biomechanical model of the prostate, running that biomechanical model a very large number of times to get statistics of how the prostate deforms according to positions of the probe and other things that might change. Um, now, that's all patient-specific. Um, this went into clinical trial, and as a result of the clinical trial, um, we then... Um, um, generated hundreds of data sets, and we found that if we had those hundreds of data sets, we could capture um, the motion or deformation of anybody's prostate, no matter what the size and shape is, um, and do that pretty accurately. And so we can generate a patient-specific shape model from that large database. Uh, the patient's MR scan comes in, we generate the model, uh, we fit that to the um, um, shape model, and then use that to enable us to predict precisely how the prostate is deformed uh, to guide therapy. And that has now, uh, again, gone into um, a clinical trial uh, with um, early results looking good. So now, my last slide, Am I, if I'm not too much over. Um, so I gave my title to the talk far too late, so I didn't get into your program. My apologies for that. Image analysis, big data, but also big challenges. 
many of the tools, image analysis tools, are actually pretty well developed now. Um, so the tools that we can apply to big data um, are, I wouldn't say they're there, there's still lots of work to be done, um, but there's quite a, now, there's a sophisticated um, armory, if you like, of, of tools, image processing tools that we can apply. These do need to be robust to the clinical care quality of images that we might um, get in the future. But the real challenge is, in my view, is um, the current work is largely based on prospectively acquired data sets of hundreds of scans, or tens or hundreds of scans, uh, with a lot of work gone into the data quality, data curation, and so on. Um, and the reason for that is you get much better quality um, results when you've got rid of the noise associated with collecting poor quality data. Um, so how do we put these things together so we can ramp up um, to potentially generate, uh, um, analyzing millions of scans. Um, international programs that should be relatively straightforward to say that we can get millions of scans, but how do we actually do that? Um, and probably more importantly, and this is different in every jurisdiction, every country, um, how can we deal with the issues of regulation, ownership, and, and patient privacy um, to enable us to have access to that data to do the um, um, interesting research that I think or get the interesting information that we can get out of them? And I think that's something that I would certainly like to um, hear other people's views on that. And there's some te uh, technical issues here. I do believe there's a danger of significant overfitting in some of the work that's been published in recent years, and we need to um, address that, make sure that we really have got a signal. Um, and then this, in my mind, maybe this is just my problem. Um, I was brought up with the, you know, the idea of the randomized clinical trials sort of thumped into me um, from an early age. Um, and the, um, where you're making a hypothesis and then you're doing the, a rigorous test to see whether that hypo hypothesis is right versus a purely data-driven approach um, where you just learn from the data. Um, and I think there's an interesting debate, too, about the um, tension, if you like, between those two valid approaches, but they are two very different approaches. And I think that, apart from the acknowledgement slide, is me done. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>